Hey! Hello, hi everyone. Hey. Welcome to Bible Live at 12.05. It's good to see a lot of you are already joining in through our Facebook streaming live. So it's great to be here uh, to be able to do a bit of Bible study with you all this afternoon. A big shout out to all our St. Michael Angels Church family and a big shout out to all those who are joining from other places as well. It's great to have you with us. Uh, I'm Reverend Tom Lowe and we're also joined by Reverend Mike Walker and Reverend Steve Collier who all minister here at St. Michael's. Great to be with you. Uh, we're going to get straight into the scriptures. As always, we're going to be looking at a psalm this morning, uh, this morning, this afternoon, uh, a psalm. And also we're still looking at the, Paul's letter to the Philippians. And we're going to be looking at that wonderful chapter, uh, chapter two, verses one to 11 in a few moments. But as always, what we're going to do is start with uh, a prayer, the same prayer that we pray every time. And we can say that together from our own our own homes. So shall we uh, pray together now? Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, help us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn and inwardly digest them, that through patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Wonderful. OK, well, we're going to be I'm going to hand over to Steve, who's going to lead us through uh, Psalm 3. Today. Mm, yeah, Psalm 3. What a great psalm. Um, there are numerous psalms, as we probably appreciate that cry out for God's help uh, with these requests for, for God to deliver us. Um, now, this particular psalm was written by David, and it was written at a time where he was fleeing from his son Absalom, who actually wanted to kill him. So he wasn't in a great place. Uh, it wasn't a, wasn't a good time for him. We get these constant calls through the psalm of uh, asking for God to deliver him, asking for God to help him and, and rescue him in that sense. So... Um, I'm just going to read that psalm now, and then uh, and then we'll have a, a little brief look at, it, at what, what it's saying to us. So Psalm 3, and we're going from the beginning. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Thank God. You. So um, it's, it's a great psalm, isn't it? And I, I just had this, uh, I, you know, when I was looking at this, I found this, this old book of mine. This is uh, Charles Spurgeon, The Treasury of David. And I, I loved a little uh, paragraph that I'll just read for you from here that he, he talks about from this psalm. I think we've got some words to come up as well, haven't we? Um, this is what Charles Spurgeon says. Let us here recall to our memory the innumerable hosts which beset our divine Redeemer, the legion of our sins, the armies of fiends, the crowd of bodily pains, the host of spiritual sorrows, and all the allies of death and hell set themselves in battle against the son of man how precious to know and believe that he has routed their hosts and trodden them down in his anger they who would have troubled us he has removed into captivity and those who would have risen up against us he has laid low the dragon lost his sting when he dashed it into the soul of jesus um so through that psalm, don't we, we get these cries for help. Verse, uh, verse 2, 
um, we get this crime. Uh, Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. So people are doubting that the Lord will deliver him. Uh, Verse four, uh, I call out to the Lord again. Verse seven, arise, Lord, deliver me, my God, strike all my enemies on the jaw, break the teeth of the wicked. So we have all this. And then as Charles Spurgeon brilliantly lays out, we have verse eight, don't we? Verse eight comes from the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. And uh, that's what Charles Spurgeon, I think, puts so brilliantly here, that that great cosmic victory, the great eternal victory of Jesus is on the cross, that he has uh, defeated the all that stands against him. And in these days for us, as as it might seem to us in, in lots of ways, like evil is coming against us, whenever it feels like that, we can know um, that any power that evil has, any uh, power there has been diminished, it's temporal, um, and you can rest safe in the knowledge that for all those who are in Christ Jesus, these prayers of David that we find here in Psalm 3 have been answered once and for all. And I just love that. I'll just read that final uh, line that I really loved from what Charles Spurgeon said. And we just leave it at that. That the dragon has lost his sting when he dashed it into the soul of Jesus. And that's what happened on the cross. So right. praise be to God who does answer our prayers and deliver us. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Wonderful thoughts uh, from Psalm 3. So rich, such a treasury of David. Uh, Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be reading from verses 1 to 11. Uh, Last last week we looked at the whole of chapter 1 and we're now moving on to chapter 2, which is again very rich and deep in its theology. So let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. I'll read from verse 1 to 11. Paul writes, Therefore, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. What a wonderful passage. Mm. Uh, It has a happy ending. That's the first thing I noticed there through all the suffering and all the humiliation and all those different things and all this servant heartedness and all the loving each other and all the laying down our lives for each other and all that the ending is just so happy and glorious isn't it that every creature of heaven and earth worships jesus that is uh the the good news that is fantastic news so no matter what situation we're in right now that is that is the hope that paul is putting before us that jesus christ is exalted to the highest place because he's such a tremendous uh, humble, servant-hearted king. And it's it's this idea that God the Father is saying, do you know what, who can I trust to run the universe for me? Who can I put at my right hand who will actually deliver and carry out my will and my heart and my desires? And there is only really one, isn't there? 
Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is fantastic news. Uh, And then we are called, aren't we, to follow in the footsteps of the great king, uh, that because we are loved and served by such a savior like Jesus, we want to become like the king in whose kingdom we live. Uh, That's my initial thought to see as as just reading that through. What about you guys? What did you spot initially as we read through that passage? Do you know, as I was preparing this passage uh, last night, it was the it was the phrase in verse one there, where Paul's listing out the things that um, we might feel as Christians, and one of them, uh, the comfort of the love of Jesus in verse one. There, it struck me that we're meant to feel something. This whatever we're doing here as Christians, it's much more than a philosophy or a religion or a way to live life well or whatever. It's actually something that we're meant to feel, it's personal, it's relational. We're meant to experience and know the comfort of Jesus' love. And that was a powerful opener for me, that one. Mm. Yeah. Any initial thoughts from you there, Steve, as well? Uh, I I really liked, there's almost like four things, aren't there, that, that Paul is saying that this sort of, this being united with Christ together should sort of look like or or we, we should be getting out of this in, in at the beginning there, as Mike was just saying, it's, it's the first one is like being like-minded sort of under this banner of the gospel, which we've been looking at for the past uh, couple of sessions, haven't we? At number two, having the same love as, as, as uh, Mike just said there, the same love as Jesus has for us of that, that personal relationship. Number three, uh, being one in, in spirit, being filled with and joined together as a church by the Holy Spirit. And then number four, being one in purpose. And again, it's back to that common gospel purpose uh, that Paul's already been laying out for us, isn't it? So I love that. It's like these four sort of banner headings, in a sense, of what it should really be looking like as we're united in Christ. Yeah. Do you know what, do you know what strikes me, though, um, is that... Um, before any of those commandments come, before any of those sort of directives of Paul's come, he first lists out those promises of the gospel there, isn't it? It's the united with Christ, comforted by his love, if any common sharing of the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. So the way he lays it out is consider the great promises of the gospel, consider how much Jesus loves you, and on the basis of those things, now go ahead and do these things. It's like that. That's the order that Paul sets out for us. It's great. What it is, it's that, that we love because he first loved us, isn't it? That's the order of it. We've got to experience his love. And then it's that that sets us free to go and love each other. And then I just i am always struck uh, by the humility of this, uh, the call to humility here that we're seeing in Christ. You know, verse three, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, uh, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I think this is something that that is is truly remarkable that Jesus manages to create within his own people. This idea that we we don't have to just look after our own needs. Um, we've got a whole community of people. We've got Jesus looking out for our needs and we've got one another in the community looking after our, our own needs. Uh, because the truth is, isn't it, when, when times get difficult, as we're all experiencing, the, the flesh, the sinful nature just wants to go, right, self-preservation, self-protection, Look out for number one first, put others second. And this is a radical call by Paul that has set forward by Christ to to start looking out uh, for one another. Uh, it did make me... Sorry, Mike, you want to jump in? Oh, I, I was just going to say, I was going to make that point about selfish ambition there. I think I said in last time, last Thursday and whenever it was, uh, Paul doesn't seem to mind how the gospel goes forward back in chapter one, whether it's because people are doing it with right motives or wrong motives. And he actually lists, selfish, if even those who are preaching the gospel out of selfish ambition, he's just pleased that the gospel's going forward. But actually here at the beginning of chapter two, he's like, I'm not giving any room, by the way, to selfish ambition. You've got to get rid of all <laughs> You've got to get rid of that and can, can consider yeah. the needs of others. So he, um, that's an important charge for us. <laughs> mm. It's really mm. striking that, you know, as we're looking out at the news and and what's going on as a society at the moment i'm just so proud of of the country that we live in in many ways that we have adopted through christian through christianity being part of our culture for centuries we have got this mentality where we do look after the most vulnerable and weakest in our society you know we see doctors and nurses uh putting their life on the line to look after the elderly those who've got uh, poor health 
those who are getting the virus. Uh, and it's it's wonderful to see our whole society pulling together in that direction. Um, but it also it just it also made me raise this question. I don't know if you've seen the news today, uh, particularly with uh, the situation with people who are wanting to uh, terminate a life that they've been given medication to be able to do that at home. And it really struck me that there are other problems going on in our society that are huge too. That we're at a place as a society where this is necessary. That people are receiving this kind of medication at home to do something to terminate a life. And it, and it made me really think, well, look, we are looking after the most vulnerable uh, at one end of the spectrum, but there are other people who are really vulnerable in our culture and society. You know, there are families, women who are getting into situations that are very difficult. Um, and uh, there's life even that's uh, not even born yet, that's still in the womb, that is weak and vulnerable too. And I'm not trying to make judgments here about... Uh, some of the decisions that people are making. But it just raises that question of we can pour so much energy to looking after people. And that's so wonderful at one end of the spectrum. But are we do we need to start asking the questions at the other end? What can we be doing as a community, as a church to look after the most vulnerable lives? Mm. Uh, those who put in situations where they have to make really difficult decisions to, to, to keep life to terminate life, all those difficult things. And I, I, I think it was really striking this morning when we saw the news on that one. What are we doing as a church where we actually do consider uh, the vulnerable in our community and how we might embrace and consider others more important than our own? Even it says here, Jesus came down from heaven and he made his home in the womb and he values all life from the moment of conception uh, to the moment that we're on our deathbeds, he's been there. He's been there and he cares and he wants to redeem every situation. I'm just asking some of those questions today. Mm. Uh, but uh, but uh, Steve, I know you wanted to talk about also, you know, this idea of what does it mean that Jesus, the divine son of God, became me? Uh, we're opening up a theological can of worms here. <laughs> Handing this one to you. Well, yeah, well, that's almost exactly what I didn't want to do, in fact. Um, but I did think it was worth, you know, uh, giving a tip of the hat to this one and just sort of uh, just addressing it. it uh, some people might read these verses and have read these verses and they might wonder whether, you know, Paul is saying that Jesus emptied himself of all of his divinity in the incarnation when he was born of Mary. All of his godness, in a sense, sort of dissipated and went away. He was, just became a, a human um, solely in that sense. Um, but as a church, that's really not what we ever want to say about Jesus. Um, and uh, I just thought I'd, I, I, I just uh, looked this up and, and got it got it ready so I could read this guy, to you guys. that the, This was dealt with brilliantly, this issue, by the early church, uh, particularly a, um, a council called the Council of Chalcedon, which was in 451 A.D., uh, and they put it like this. Um, Jesus Christ is recognized in two natures. That's uh, his divine nature and his human nature. He's recognized in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The distinction of natures being in no way annulled by the union, but rather the characteristics of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person and one subsistence so what we read from that is that we get this phrase that you might have heard before jesus is both fully god and fully human so that's what we get from that and i think that's what we want to read when we read when we're reading this type of passage here uh, but like i say i don't think actually this is the main point or the most important thing that paul wants us to take out of this i don't think paul's laying out a theology of the incarnation i think the important point here when we read specifically from sort of verse five onwards in this passage um, is is the attitude of Jesus, that he was willing to stoop down in that sense. The, the eternal son of God, the king of the universe, was willing to stoop down to become a servant. And I'll just pick up something that Mike was saying earlier, that we have, um, you know, these promises of God all laid out at the beginning there. Then we have sort of the response to that that we know that and then we're serving so we have this sort of stooping and this serving but the third strand of that is that after that after the service after that you know suffering that jesus went through as well we have the glory 
we have the exaltation of Christ at the end of this passage. I don't know if you've noticed that. But I think that that's a, that's a really nice pattern there. We have we receive the promises of God. We, we sort of give ourselves to his service. And in, in the future, we'll receive that glory. I think that's what Paul's really thinking about here. But I just thought I'd pick that one up. Thanks, Steve. Any more last thoughts from you, Mike? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, just uh, I suppose the idea that um, to be most like Jesus is we're most like Jesus, if you like, when we're most in the service of one another or in the service of other people. It's uh, I think that's the summary point for me that I'm taking away from this. Uh, if I want to be really like Jesus today <laughs> and have the mindset that he had and be like him in every way, I've got to uh, get down on my knees and serve other people. That's the takeaway for me. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I just one last thought I saw there was the idea that Jesus, even though he was uh, equally God, uh, equally divine up in heaven with his father, he did not consider equality of God something to be grasped, something to use to his own advantage. And it just really made me think about that word grasp, uh, that so often in life we're trying to grasp to get higher up the ladder, aren't we, to get more and more security for our life, grasping to trying to hold on to the things that we've got. Uh, but slowly but surely, the, Jesus tells us that if we try and grasp onto life, uh, it actually slips through our fingers and we lose it. Uh, whereas if we're most, taking that attitude of Jesus, where it's like, look, everything I have, I pour it all out for others out of love. And then as we pour out our life in, a, in an amazing way, God the Father gives us more life and fills us up more. Uh, and I think we sometimes, as a world, get that the wrong way around. We think we've got to grasp and grab a hold of life and keep it and not let it go. But Jesus is saying if we let it go, ironically, the Father fills us with even more life. Uh, that's something we uh, challenges me every day as I live and uh, as I try and hold on to different things. Uh, Mike, is there any uh, comments coming through that you want to to people on Facebook? It's great to see people checking in. Uh, Linda Savile, hi, and um, uh, Maxine as well, our regulars. Sarah Raynham, great to see you. Wendy Woods, Helen Brown, uh, regularly with us. Natalie Mason as well, good to see you, Natalie. And Jenny Wilson and uh, Neil Matthews, lots of people checking in for the uh, for the Bible Live at 12.05, which is fantastic. Um, this comment, let me, uh, where was it? Uh, I had a comment up here. Well, Helen Brown's comment, here's a good one. She just highlights verse 8 for us. Humbled himself and became obedient to death. Uh, thanks, Helen, for that one. Wendy Woods as well was sharing this one. A thought from 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, encouraging one another and building each other up. It's a good cross-reference uh, to this, these verses in Philippians as well. Loads of other great comments from people. Lots of people having problems with the sound today. I'm not quite sure what's going on with that, but... Uh, I hope in I hope in the end you you got there. Neil Matthews making a great point about uh, how society mm. is to get this time, and then mm. this is all over. Sundays will become more important than ever, and I really believe that too, Neil. That uh, actually, I think after all of this, we're going to value church a lot more than we ever have. How precious uh, being a community in, in one another's lives are much more than you know the stuff we're gathering in life and the. And the jobs we have, we're going to realise that church, uh, Jesus and the community of Jesus is the most important thing. Amen to that. Thanks, Neil. Mm. Brilliant. All right. OK, well, let's close in prayer. Let's uh, turn to the prayer that we always pray together. And if we pray this in our own homes, that the word of God would dwell richly in our hearts, that we would uh, take away uh, from this Philippians chapter two that we've looked at this afternoon. So let's pray together. Merciful God, teach us to be faithful in change and uncertainty, that trusting in your word and obeying your will, we may enter the unfailing joy of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Stay in touch. Tune in again for this Thursday for Bible Live at 12.05. We'll be carrying on where we left off. Uh, look forward to hearing from you. And uh, also a reminder of Sunday as well. We'll be streaming live again this Sunday. Stay safe and stay in touch, everyone. <laughs>